Words of the world are the life of the world. That line was first spoken by Wallace Stevens in his poem, An Ordinary Evening in New Haven, not far from here, 70 years ago, November 4th, 1949. Planicky Library has the typescript sheets, the original typescript that Mr. Stevens read from on that ordinary evening in New Haven, and they're accompanied by a manuscript note, a handwritten note. Uh, the papers are at Beinecke and Yale because of Mrs. Irwin Goodenow, Evelyn Goodenow, whose husband was the president of the academy, headquartered three blocks down Prospect Street. And the note says, Stevens gave the sheets to Mrs. Goodenow, who had sat beside the poet and, quote, studied his stage fright during the earlier parts of the program. Archives give us extraordinary access to the humanity of the people represented there. And I have to say, this morning, I'm glad to know that a future Pulitzer Prize winner had anxiety even amidst a friendly audience 70 years ago. I first read that poem myself when I was a rising junior in Yale College during a summer course on modern American poetry. And to riff off of Goethe and the late great Yale Jerry Pelican, what we have inherited from our parents, we must possess again in order to make it our own. That, in many ways, is the work of the university. And that poem, I have possessed again and again and again and again, and have made it my own. If you happen to follow me on Instagram, you know ordinary evening or afternoon or morning in New Heaven is my go-to verse, even this morning. Now, today is my 13,076th day at Yale. I've had a few ordinary evenings, mornings, afternoons, and even late nights here. I've walked the halls of this place for 36 years of its more than 318 years of existence. I've been a New Havener for 11% of the days since John Davenport first preached under a huge oak tree not far from here. And I acknowledge, moreover, that we gather on land that the Quinnipiac people occupied, cultivated, and stewarded for thousands of years. In fact, every day at home, I look out over the Quinnipiac Meadows toward Granis Island, which was a seasonal home for the Quinnipiac people. And as I look out in the evening or in the morning, I'm reminded, as the great scholar John Menta said, that the Quinnipiac people were people who lived lives where Thanksgiving was a daily ritual a cosmology that has much to offer us even today. So I know a little bit about this place and about its history, and maybe that's why Franz and Julie invited me to come here this morning and to share with you. But first, some housekeeping before we proceed. With me, I invite you to close your laptops, stow away your mobile phones, stash your PlayStations, remove your VR goggles, and disregard all digital devices for the duration of this talk. As a little incentive, you all should have jotters that you can make notes on. And if you're watching this on tape, no, you don't get a jotter. There is a benefit for showing up. So I ask that we get out of the cloud and rest comfortably here on the common ground of Kroon Hall on this campus in New Haven. And that we listen together for clarity amidst the indistinct chatter that is so much our digitally mediated lives that we seek, as it were, signal amidst the noise. I'm joining you in this adventure of Yale Digital Unplugged. I will inflict no PowerPoint slides on you. I'm not going to read from a tiny screen between me and you. And I might even make eye contact as a sign of respect that you are due in this shared reality that we make together. For you are a part of this program, not a mere consumer of data. As my friend Kaysun, great Ghanaian-Canadian musician, tweeted a few months ago, the real conspiracy is to turn everyone into a spectator. 
Today, let's all be participants with our minds open and active. Now, Franz and Julie actually invited me, as Franz noted, because we shared a great adventure together over the last year and a half or so to renew and refresh the Beinecke Library website, which I think is the biggest single all-in project that Yale Sites has done to date. And I trust not for long will that record be held, but we're glad to have been the first. The project had really broad participation across the Beinecke Library, working with our colleagues in the university printer's office. And I shout them out, design of a fantastic jotter and all that we do. John Gamble, Rebecca Martz, and their colleagues help us at the Beinecke Library to keep it real. And keeping it real was a big aim of the effort. Beinecke's director, E.C. Schroeder, charged us from the beginning and encouraged us throughout to stay true to our library's 2027 visions and aspirations, which include, and I quote, the call to, quote, provide all who enter virtually a level of service, accessibility, and inspiration on par with that enjoyed on site, that our digital be inspired by and on par with our actual. We had, as you may know, in 2015, opened a new site at 344 Winchester, state-of-the-art home for Beinecke's Technical Services Group. And then in 2016, the iconic Bunshaft building was reopened after a complete renovation. And so in some ways, our work culminating on February 21st of this year was following on with the digital renovation, just as we had had physical renovations before. The work, the site, aims to evoke the actual and to provide clear paths for the varied constituencies, and they really are quite varied. We have 180,000 public visitors on site and obviously hundreds of thousands online. We have high-tech folk. We have low-tech folk. We have people who are doing research across all the fields of human endeavor. We have faculty. We have students. We have people who see us here and people who only engage us online. So it's a very varied audience. To keep it real, the new look of the website matches in the digital realm the library's design systems for print, them itself informed by the physical architecture of the library that opened in 1963. On the site, in the footer, we use Matthew Carter's marvelous typeface, as is used throughout the university, an anchor that ties us to Yale University overall and to the Yale University library system of which we are a part. And then we use, as you've hopefully seen, how many people have seen the new website? Those who didn't raise their hands are invited to, but only after we're done. And <laughs> you've gone off airplane mode and reopened your laptops. Um, we use a uh, universe condensed family for titles and headers, and that's a typeface that Rebecca uses throughout our print. It's a typeface that dates to the era, mid-century modern era of the Beinecke construction, so it also, again, evokes who we are and matches with our physical manifestations in print and in swag. And then we use a bright, uh, a cool, warm red that is inspired by warm printer's red. And again, a color, highlight color that we use across our print and that you'll see around the building and in other things that represent us as we go on the road. The results of keeping it real are, we hope, as it says in the library itself, quote, an inspiration to all who enter. It's a site that seeks, like the library, to be both grounded and boundless. Or to invoke Stevens, we keep coming back and coming back to the real, to the hotel instead of the hymns that fall upon it out of the wind. We seek the poem of pure reality, untouched by trope or deviation, straight to the word, straight to the transfixing object, to the object at the exactest point at which it is itself transfixing by being purely what it is, a view of New Haven, say, through the certain eye. The eye made clear of uncertainty with the sight of simple seeing without reflection. 
We seek nothing beyond reality. Within it, everything, the spirits alchemicana included, the spirit that goes roundabout and through included, not merely the visible, the solid, but the movable, the moment. We seek nothing beyond reality. Within it, everything. On behalf of the Beinecke Library, I want to publicly acknowledge and name the people of Yale ITS whose collective labor made the new website real. Lisa Sawin, Dana Libnikus, Franz himself, Javon Johnson, Tabor Lightfoot, Chow Hang Lu, Vincent Massaro, Sylvia Perez, Julie Ramatia, Mark Saba, and Heather White, and also Rebecca Martz in the University Printer's Office. And I want to acknowledge the people of the Beinecke Library who kept it real and made this real. In the interest of time, I'm not going to name them because it is everyone of the Beinecke Library who contributed ideas and time and talent to this site. There are 110 or so. I encourage you to read their names on the website after we're done. By working with the Yale Sites team, we consciously chose to bring this work home. It was a wise choice. Outside vendors and consultants can be great, but there is a quantitative and qualitative benefit in working with people who are both colleagues and neighbors. As a longtime citizen of Yale, I have been delighted to see how the homegrown capacity to create websites here has flourished. It's great now, as a consumer and patron, that the people I rely on for digital infrastructure and design are nearby, and that, frankly, there are people I run into at the farmer's market in Worcester Square and other places around town. Happily gone are the days of back and forth email, to set up a conference call a week out, to schedule an on-site meeting a month out. And instead, we have excellent assistance right next door from real people we really know. And bringing the work back home also made a difference in the results you see, because all of the people I named know the reality and were informed, really informed, by the reality of the library. All of our meetings happened on site in the library, and there's something in the air of the place. The people who made this site walked the walk and breathed the air time after time after time. And I have to say, to shout out Dana, and along with my colleagues, I was delighted not only by the time we spent in a room together, but that she often, with her laptop after meetings had concluded, stuck around the courtyard level and did her own work there, remotely as it were, but that's actually not remotely. And I don't think that there's a precise quantitative measure that we could apply to what that ministry of presence meant, but I am confident the results speak for themselves of being there, actually, truly being there. For you see, there is a virtue with engaging reality that surpasses the delights of virtual reality. Now, the work we did together resulted in a wonderful website that does work well. Some here, and part of me, are quants. And the quants will be happy to know that we have solid data so far to prove that it works. In the first 100 days, which would be February 21 to May 31st, the number of unique views of the homepage grew 5%. And that's good. And we obsess a bit about the homepage because in our design thinking, we really prioritized and privileged those who don't know us. And so we really sweated that in particular. So increased traffic is good. You don't want it going in the other direction, that's for sure. But here's the better news. Average time on the homepage is down by 33% while the bounce rate is down by 32%. Long story short, not only are more people coming, more people are more quickly finding ways to go and going there rather than if we, again, use the real building, just going through the revolving door for a while and popping back out with ever, never making it into the library. 
So these quantitative measures are really great news, and the trend in the first 100 plus days has been very good. We also have qualitative testimony in person and online. My favorite comes from our colleague Britta Belli in OPAC, who had the powerful, simple reaction on Twitter, the fire emoji. It's good if your design merits the fire emoji. And I'm even thinking that I may use that as the sum total in the year-end results column of my Managing at Yale performance process review. <laughs> so the reality is this. More people are finding their way more quickly and more often to what really matters. The collections, the programs, the exhibitions, the people, the research, the scholarship of the library. And in communications, that's what really matters. That's what really counts. We need to measure success not only in the metrics that Google gives us and that social media analytics provide, but the measure, sometimes quite intangible but real, is how well we serve to welcome students and faculty and researchers and public visitors to the place so that they can engage, confront, and build on the rich record of human experience and cultural achievement that we steward. So a clearer, faster website means we can better serve people as they engage the past in the present for the future. Perhaps our mantra is less time on website for more time on real site. A clearer, faster website is a means towards the end of more people lingering, wandering, exploring, and looking for themselves in the actual library. Some of you may know I'm a Kentuckian, and Kentuckians are always happy when other Kentuckians are cited. So I was delighted to hear words of Hunter S. Thompson yesterday. You'll recall them. Faster, faster, until the thrill of speed overcomes the fear of death. Now, if you know Brother Hunter and his life, he did know a little bit about speed, both the motorcycle variety and the amphetamine variety. And his life and living and its ending brings to mind another great saying, not of Kentucky, but of the world, speed kills. So this Kentuckian's mantra might rather be, faster, faster, until you get where you can slow down and think and engage with reality. For you see, we seek nothing beyond reality. Within it, everything. And so for the Beinecke Library, a faster, better website means more people might come to see the real first printing of the US Declaration of Independence, which will be on view again soon, June 28th to July 11th. It is the first document of the nation, printed on July 4th, 1776, one of 26 copies surviving of about 200, printed in Philadelphia, on that day, July 4th, 1776, and immediately sent out on horseback and stagecoach throughout the states of the new nation. It is the original viral media of the nation. And to see that document is to find nothing beyond reality and within it, everything. When it was on view last year, I happened upon a family who was visiting from Toledo, Ohio, who had come to see the Declaration of Independence on view. The parents were standing on either side of the case, reading it aloud, the full declaration to each other and to their two kids. One declared as she read, these words don't seem so old. They seem very relevant right now. Indeed, they are at once timeless and timely. And that is a reality that is most accessible in the presence of the real thing. The papers in the Beinecke Library and special collections elsewhere on campus and around the world are not dead trees. They are living testimony. They are actual evidence of who we were, who we are, and who we might be. And so a faster, better website means more people might come to see the first printing 
of Frederick Douglass's oration given on July 5th, 1852 to the Rochester Ladies Anti-Slavery Society. That is where Mr. Douglass asks, what to the American slave is your 4th of July? And Mr. Douglass provided the answer from the harsh reality he knew. Mr. Douglass wrote, said and, and is printed. I answer a day that reveals to him more than all the other days in the year the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham, your boasted liberty and unholy license, your national greatness, swelling vanity. Your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless, your denunciations of tyrants, brass-fronted impudence, your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery. Your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgiving, with all your religious parade and solemnity are to him mere bombast, fraud, and deception, impiety, and hypocrisy, a thin veil to cover up crimes which would disgrace a nation of savages. Words that echo today. This is the 400th anniversary, 400th anniversary of when a ship set sail with enslaved Africans headed to Jamestown. These are words that are timely and timeless. For you see, friends, there is a virtue in confronting reality, perhaps even more so when that reality itself is far from virtuous. The reality accessible in repositories like the Beinecke Library and peers across campus, around the nation, and across the world have the virtue of encouraging us to remember and they remind us that our nation's deeds do not always match its words. And so a faster, better website means that more people might encounter the first printing of the Women's Rights Convention at Seneca Falls, July 19th, 20th, 1848. A report printed at the North Star Press, Frederick Douglass's press, and a report that includes a declaration of sentiments which I think needs to be much better known as a document of the nation. 171 years ago, the convention declared, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equal in 1848. For words of the world are the life of the world. And a faster, better website means more people might engage more deeply with the living legacy, legacy of Langston Hughes, whose literary archives live in 672 boxes at the heart of our campus. They might remember his words, words that inspired Lorraine Hansberry and Martin Luther King Jr., words that echo today, what happens to a dream deferred? And a faster, better website means more people might be inspired by how Hughes reckoned with his reality how he confronted the past and examined it, and still concluded with an eye to the future, as he said, oh yes, I say it plain. America never was America to me, and yet I swear this oath, America will be. And so a faster, better website makes it possible to enable countless real-time encounters in the exhibition hall, in the reading room, in the classrooms, as well as proxy encounters on the digital library. That oft impalpable impact is in many ways what counts the most. As the brilliant Elizabeth Alexander wrote in 2016 when the National Museum of African American History and Culture opened, and I quote, historians and curators are heroes the digging, the digging, the trench work and sleuthing, the conjuration it takes to piece together filament by filament a history, and then to present it so that we understand and experience it as a living process is nothing short of wizardry. History, Elizabeth wrote, is not a triumphal march to the finish line. History is not all upturned faces nor ascendant. History is made up of struggle, contradiction, resistance. Professor Alexander keeps it real, and so must we. Keeping it real also means not being distracted by the brightest, shiniest objects and not diluted by the disruption machine. 
Yale alumna Jill Lepore got right what the gospel of innovation gets wrong in her 2014 New Yorker piece, and I quote, disruptive innovation doesn't explain change. It's not a law of nature. It's an artifact of history, an idea forged in time. It's the manufacture of a moment of upsetting and edgy uncertainty. Transfixed by change, it's blind to continuity. It makes a very poor profit. Professor Lepore keeps it real, so must we. Spoiler alert, the machines will not save us by themselves. And the evidence is all around us to see. Valerie Strauss headlined in the Washington Post a couple weeks ago, new report on virtual education. As it turns out, it is too good to be true. As Brett Stevens opined in the Times on May 3rd, over the past several years, we've learned a lot about the unintended consequences of social media. Platforms intended to bring us closer together make us angrier and more isolated. Platforms aimed at democratizing speech empower demagogues. Platforms celebrating community violate our privacy in ways we scarcely realize and serve as conduits for deceptions hiding in plain sight. Max Boot, a couple weeks ago in the Post, asked, are we becoming too stupid to govern ourselves? and observed, it's true that the internet has put a lot of information online, but like diners passing up a healthy salad for an artery-clogging cheeseburger, many information consumers are instead digesting junk news. And just the other day, M.R. O'Connor reported of a new, on a new study. She was writing, uh, M.R. was writing in the Washington Post on June 5th. The headline was, ditch the GPS, it's ruining your brain. When people use tools, the story says, such as GPS, they tend to engage less with navigation. Therefore, brain area responsible for navigation is less used. And consequently, their brain areas involved in navigation tend to shrink. A little bit scary. So at a time when machines are gaining autonomy, are we doing enough to protect and promote human liberty? In a time of deep fakes and information overload, are we doing enough to keep it real? We surely can use quantum science, but we also must have quality humanities if we were to have quality of life as humans. Libraries, museums, and universities stand as essential arsenals for liberty and democracy. They house the living materials necessary to confront what Gore Vidal called the United States of Amnesia, where we learn nothing because we remember nothing. Libraries, museums, and universities invite us to be alive in the world, to call forth active citizens rather than passive spectators. Libraries, museums, and universities should keep it real in an ethos, in an era when the ethos of creative destruction runs amok in the markets, we should be, in the words of President Salovey, a place of creative construction, a place of both innovation and tradition, a place where we draw from the past in the present to build the future. President Salve said, Yale embraces, quote, creative construction, not orthodox adherence to the past, nor the pursuit of innovation merely for its own sake, but a dynamic tradition. We don't just seek to make new things, we make, seek to make things better. Now, as we collectively aim to make both better things and to make things better, let me offer some tangible, practical ideas applicable, perhaps, to workplace culture. First, and maybe second and last, get out more often. Like Dana, practice a ministry of presence. Let's not all be stuck in our cubicles, our offices, our hotel space, wherever we are routinely where we do the work. Use Zoom rooms, for sure, but also make real room in your schedule to wander, to explore, to look closely at this extraordinary place, to acknowledge what it is 
its opportunities, its challenges, its history, for it is in that that we can construct the future. If you're in ITS, as many are here, communications like me, service providers to departments and schools be like the Yale Sites team was with us at the Binocle. Really get to know the place, be in it, be present. Spend real time on site as we all create things to live online. Go to the Grove Street Cemetery. Go to the art gallery. Go to the Center for British Art. Go to the New Haven Museum. Give yourself the time. It will pay off in many ways. And remember, words of the world are the life of the world. In the beginning was the word, a book that's on permanent view at the Beinecke Library says, writing matters. Writing really matters in this place and for our world. And since it's summer season, some potential summer reading, I have never gone wrong with Maria Popova and brain pickings. If you don't know it, read it. And read a book or two or three. We should not be the kind of people who accept Bill Barr's blended reality. Read the actual Mueller report. <laughs> Read my dear friend Casey Gerald's There Will Be No Miracles Here, a powerful memoir by a recent alum of Yale who definitely keeps it real. And or read John Menta's history of the Quinnipiac people on whose land we stand. Acknowledge not only that history, but get to know that history. When you visit the Grove Street Cemetery, pay your respects at the life, uh, at the grave of William Grimes, who in 1825 wrote the first first person narrative and published it himself of an escape uh, of a person who escaped enslavement and lived in this town and is buried in our cemetery. At the Beinecke Library, we have the first printing. His ancestors have ensured that it remains in print, a powerful, powerful document. And in this 400th anniversary of the arrival of the first enslaved people on the shores of what is now our country, read Ibram Kendi's extraordinary book, Stamped from the Beginning to understand the reality on the ground and the ideas that shaped this nation and that we live with today. Ibram Kendi does extraordinary historic and archival work and again shows that the documents and the history are not dead. It is still amongst us now. So on this ordinary morning in New Haven, I encourage you to stay for the rest of the conference, but get out more often. <laughs> On this ordinary morning in New Haven, I think we all know we live in extraordinary times. And we need to acknowledge that we live in times of existential challenge to what this nation is, to what this world is. And as on this ordinary morning in New Haven, we acknowledge that we live in extraordinary times. I encourage you, equip yourselves well. The world requires the reality-based community now more than ever. I shall neither insult your intelligence nor assault your conscience. You know what to do. Seek nothing beyond reality within it everything. Thank you.